Welcome to Approximation Algorithms and the lecture on random sampling and priority sampling. My name is Rasmus Pei. We're going to start up with a familiar example, namely how to gather information via polls. Then we'll discuss how to do similar things using algorithms. Reservoir sampling, we'll discuss tenant inequalities, weighted random sampling, and finally priority sampling. Consider the two following set setting. In the first setting, we make calls to 2,000 random phone numbers. Among those 2,000, 1,000 people respond. 60% of them say that they are going to vote for the current government. And the rest, 40%, say that they will vote for the opposition. Now the question is, what can we say? about the general population. How many of them are going to vote for the current government? In the second case, a newspaper calls 100 companies and asks them what the probability is that they are going to make a new hire in 2021. So we get probabilities P1 through P100 and we may ask what fraction of companies among the 100 and overall do we expect will hire in 2021? Take a moment to think about these two questions. To say something about the first case, we need to know something about the response rates or sampling probabilities for the two distinct populations as government of government voters and as up of opposition voters. Think about it like this. There are four categories depending on what they vote for and whether or not they respond. There are several different distributions in these four categories that are consistent with the information we have so far. One possible distribution is that actually both government and opposition voters are 50%, but they have different response rates. Another possible distribution is that the two categories actually have the same response rate and hence actually 60% of the voters are government voters. We can distinguish between these two cases if we know how to weigh the different responses. Let's consider a randomly selected voter X and the set A of voters who respond to the call. By definition, the probability that X is an A given that X is a government voter is the probability that X is in A and a government voter divided by the probability that X is a government voter. The former of these two is what we can observe. The latter is what we want to estimate. So if we have a, an estimate or know the ratio on the left hand side, well then we can compute what we want from what we can observe. In case two, we can think about random variables xi, where xi is one if company i hires and zero otherwise. So the responses from the companies can be interpreted as expectations for this random variable. The number of hires in expectation is simply the sum then of these random variables, which is the sum of expectations, which is the sum of the reported numbers pi. This is the number of hires among the 100. What about the general population? So suppose we have n companies and the 100 are randomly sampled. The expected total number of hires can be expressed, again, in terms of another random variable, yi, where yi is 1 if the company is sampled and 0 otherwise. So then we can simply express this uh, sum over all companies as the sum of probabilities that xi hires and is sampled divided by the probability that i is sampled. This is again the sum of pi's from before divided by the sampling probability which is 100 over n. Or in other words we have to multiply by the in inverse of the sampling rate. Though this works in the sense of having the right expectation, we are going to see later that it can be improved by using so-called weighted sampling. That's 
take samples according to the weight and samples high weight items more frequently than low weight items. A useful tool for understanding sampling algorithmically is the so-called Fisher-Yates sh shuffle that maintains a random sample of elements under insertions. We store a counter n, which is the number of elements currently stored, and a random permutation of the n elements, say in an array. And we need to maintain this under insertion of new elements. So initially, obviously we start with zero elements and an empty array A. When we insert, we increase the counter and add the element to the array. So the first one, there is no choice really, but for starting from the second one, we have a choice. We need to decide where the new element should be put. There are two possibilities. Maybe we choose the first one. And where, wherever we put the uh, new element, we are going to move that element to the new entry that is added at the end of the array. In general, we are going to have some random permutation of the existing elements that we extend to have one more capacity for one more element. We choose a random index for the new element and displace the element at position i, which was chosen, to the last uh, entry. It's easy to show the invariant that a is a random permutation of the elements x1 through xn. How does this relate to sampling? Well, there is a sampling algorithm known as reservoir sampling that can be thought of as simply keeping some of the elements of the fisher yates shuffle. In particular, suppose we keep only the first S entries of the shuffle. Then we have a random sample consisting of S elements. Then moving an element at position I to the last position simply corresponds to discarding it. In distributed settings, sampling is very useful. Think about three data sets, A, B, and C, that reside on different computers. And suppose that each of them have taken a reservoir sample of that data set. I claim that we can combine the three samples into a single reservoir sample of the union of the data sets, assuming that A, B, and C are disjoint data sets. The reservoir sample we come up with should have size s, and we want the probability of sampling a particular element should be the size of the sample divided by the size of the dataset. Sampling is a very powerful tool for understanding a population without seeing all of it. In order to understand the approximation that we would get using sampling, we have to understand tail inequalities. Suppose we have a bunch of random variables x1 through xn and the quantity we want to estimate is the sum of these random variables with ha which has some expectation mu. How close is the observed sum to mu? We can think about the dis probability distribution of the sum over all xi. It has some expectation somewhere in the middle and a distribution of possible variables, values. So one question is what is kind of the typical deviation? And this is often expressed in terms of the variance. One fact is that most of the probability mass is going to be within an interval of length that is roughly two times the variance. In the setting above, if the var variables are independent, we can bound that by two times the square root of the expectation. Another time, type of question you can ask is how likely is it that there's a large deviation? So say that we, are, we get less than half the variance or more than twice the variance. These are called tail probabilities. And it's possible to show that in this setting, again assuming independence, that they are exponentially small in the expectation view. We're going to formalize both of these uh, things on the next slide. The former is called Chebyshev's inequality. It describes the behavior close to the expectation and Chernoff bounds describe the behavior further away from the expectation. In general, the larger the uh, expectation, the more precise. 
Let's relate the tail bounds to approximation and also make things a little bit more precise. Chebyshev's inequality says that the probability that x deviates from its expectation by more than k can be bounded by the variance divided by k squared. In terms of approximation guarantee, if we assume that the variance is relatively small, which is often the case, that it can be bounded, for example, by the expectation, then the probability that x is reasonably close, let's say between one half of the expectation and two times the expectation, is, is good. So it's roughly 1 minus 4 over the expectation. So this is just an example of what you can get by Chebyshev. In general, it gives a whole trade-off between uh, accuracy and probability. The Chernoff bound gives considerably better um, bounds if we are far from the expectation. And also tells us something quite close to the expectation. So again, remember that we are considering a sum of random indicator variables the probability that we get something that is a factor either 1 minus epsilon, at most 1 minus epsilon times the expectation, or 1 plus epsilon times the expectation is exponentially small in the expectation, as I claimed before. And um, the constant in the exponent is related to epsilon squared. So for the upper side, it's epsilon squared over 2, and for the, uh, sorry, for the lower side, and for the uh, other side, it's epsilon squared over 4, and there are different variants of this. In terms of approximation guarantee, we see that if the expectation is more than 4 log 2 over delta divided by epsilon squared, then we get that x is in the interval 1 minus epsilon times the expectation to 1 plus epsilon times the expectation with probability at least 1 minus delta. Now let's turn to a different kind of random sampling in which we want to take element weights into account. So we have a bunch of items that each come with a weight. Let's say that the item i comes with a weight wi, which is non-negative. What we want to do intuitively is to sample higher weight items more frequently than lower weight items. And this is in order to simply gather more information about high weight items. So let's let's look at a small example. So we have our weight distribution here, a bunch of items with, with different weights. So suppose we just want to sample a single item, then there's a very natural thing one can do. So we can sample uh, item i with probability wi divided by the sum of all weights. So this gives a sampling pro probability proportional to the weight, which is nice. And the normalizing factor down there ensures that this is actually a probability distribution that we uh, get one sample in expectation. But if we want to sample five elements, we want to sample all of them. So, so how does this look in, in general? So let's consider a, a general sample size S. So the idea here is that we find some cutoff points, which, which we call uh, tau such that if we sum uh, the minimum over all weights of wi over tau and 1, we get exactly s. So in the case where we sample all, this corresponds to tau equal to 0. The minimum will always be um, 1. And in the case where we sample just a single item, it corresponds to tau equal to the sum of all items. But in general, tau will be somewhere in the middle where there are some weights that are above tau and they will be included in the sample with probability 1. And there are some elements that are below tau and they will be included in the sample with probability, which is the weight divided by tau. And it's easy to see that if we do it like this, the expected sample size is exactly S. So let's call this sampling probability PI minimum of 1 and wi over tau. When we do weighted random sampling, we are often interested in computing some function of the weights. 
simplest case here is when we're interested in the sum over some set of items of the weights. And it's important to stress this set is not known before sampling, so we cannot really adjust the sampling uh, procedure based on knowledge of the set. Let's call this set Q. Uh, one thing that we can do from the sample is to compute the sum of weights of those elements we have actually sampled. So in order to get an estimator of every items, the sum of weights of all items in Q, including the ones we haven't sampled, we can use the estimator U hat, which is simply the sum of the sample weights divided by the sampling probabilities. Now I claim that the expected value of mu hat can be written as a sum over i, all i, of the probability that i is in the sample multiplied by wi over pi. So this is a sum over all items in Q. So why is that? Well, to see this, write the definition of mu hat in a different way. We sum over all i in Q, an indicator variable that i is an s, multiplied by wi over pi. The expected value of the indicator variable is exactly the probability that i is an s. Altogether, this means that the expected value of mu hat is exactly mu. And we can use um, mu hat as an unbiased estimator. An important property of weighted sampling is that it gets the po smallest possible variance among all sampling methods that use space S. The estimator that divides by the sampling probability is also known as the horvitz thompson estimator, and it's an old technique from statistics. In the book, it's described how one can do efficient updates and merges of samples that are weighted. Details are a bit complicated, so I refer the, to the book for those. The final topic of this lecture is priority sampling, which is a simpler way of doing weighted random sampling. The idea is to assign to each element a priority. So item X gets a priority QX that is computed as follows. We sample a random value, alpha x, in, zero to, in the interval 0 to 1, uniformly. Then qx is simply the weight divided by alpha x. So we see that higher weight elements tend to have higher priorities, but even low weight elements can have a very high priority. Now the sample is simply the s items that have the highest priorities. This is extremely simple to implement. In order to give an estimator, we need to define the threshold, which becomes equal to the S plus first highest priority, so the highest priority that is not sampled. And we can maintain the sample and also the threshold using a priority queue. Now the estimator, unbiased estimator you had is again a sum over all the samples in, in the set Q that we care about. And what we sum is the maximum of one and the weight Wx over tau, this threshold. Now I claim that this is an unbiased estimator. That is that the expected value of mu hat is exactly the weight of x, if this is for the case of a single element. Um, and even something stronger is, is true namely that the expectation, the expected value of mu hat given a particular value of tau is equal to wi. The full proof is in the book, but let me illustrate why this is true. So suppose this is the weight distribution. Now the priorities occur, are given by dividing by a number that is less than one. So the priorities will be greater, sometimes much bigger, sometimes just a little bit bigger. Let's define a value tau prime, which is the est highest priority. And let's look at a new element x. So t prime is the third highest priority in this example among other elements than x. Now there are two cases to consider. First, if wx is greater than or equal to tau prime, then it doesn't matter what alpha x is. x will end up in the sample with probability 1. Otherwise, if wx is strictly less than tau, 
So this is the case here. Um, then, depending on the value of alpha x, we may or may not end up in the sample. And if you work it out, it turns out that x ends up in the sample if and only if alpha x is less than wx over tau, which happens with probability wx over tau. Priority sampling is due to Duffield, Lund and Torp, the latter two which are Danish, and Mikkel Torp is even a professor at the University of Copenhagen, so you may know him from other courses. It's known to be optimal up to a single sample, in the sense that a priority sample of size s plus 1 is at least as good as a weighted random sample of size s.